Um, so what we're going to ask is, to, Rosie will talk for a few minutes, talk about her journey here, talk about her today. I think today's been quite an exciting day. Yeah. Then we'll give an opportunity for people in the room to talk about why they voted and why the student vote was such a big part of this year's general election. And then there will be an opportunity to do a bit of generic question and answers. So over to you, Rosie. Hello, everyone. Um, this has been my first week. I haven't prepared anything. I'm just going to sort of chat it through. Um, and it really is like arriving at school. You kind of arrive, but you've given all these bags and laptops and iPads and things and it's all just a bit scary and overwhelming but there are kind of corridors that lead everywhere I met a woman there's all these people called doorkeepers so they kind of wear these posh uniforms and things and you ask them if you're lost and where to go and one woman said I've been working here 30 years I'm still discovering new corridors and I thought that's not what I want to hear I want to hear that you know everything and everywhere so I've discovered all kinds of amazing things um, obviously my, I've done my first parliamentary Labour Party meeting where Jeremy Corbyn sort of summed up the campaign. There was, it was a kind of jubilant meeting. Everyone was really thrilled with what we've achieved. Um, we've just decided, you know, we have to be united now as a party and go forward and just celebrate our success and build on it. We're all being prepared, I'm afraid, brace yourselves, that we may well have to go through this again in a few months' time because Parliament is just so... We, it's kind of all over the place. We don't really know what's going on yet. Um, it's unusual, but the Prime Minister has um, delayed the Queen's speech. It was supposed to be on Monday. It's going to be on Wednesday now. I think that's officially confirmed, but we keep getting different messages. And until the Queen's speech happens, we can't do anything in Parliament. No debates, no questions, no speeches, anything like that. So we have to wait for that bit to sort of go ahead. And after that, we can sort of get down to the business of you know, getting on with trying to make people's lives better. But the Labour Party has got a much better chance of that because we're so, you know, our majority is bigger. Theirs is, you know, we, you know, we don't really know what they're doing with the DUP. There's already loads of petitions going on about the DUP's record on women's rights and LGBT rights, which is pretty much non-existent from what I can understand. So obviously I will be, that's a massive priority for me. I got sworn in as well today, so I'm now officially an MP, which is quite... <laughs> Through all the letters I keep getting with people, and it's mostly this week I've had letters about railings in Canterbury. Kind of <laughs> traffic railings seems to be a really big hot subject, so I'm going to have to get all over that. Um, I've got a big important meeting tomorrow about the hospital. Um, that's obviously one of my huge priorities. Um, people are pretty desperate and really worried about it. Um, the future of the KNC is looking very worrying, and the urgent care centre, which you may know was an A&E, which has been downgraded to this urgent care centre, is in fact due to close on the 19th, so literally a few days. So that will actually mean that if anyone's rushed anywhere by ambulance or has a fall or is really seriously hurt or ill, has a heart attack, they actually won't be able to be taken to the KNC anymore. Ambulances just won't go there. That is serious, you know, and there's all sorts of roadworks going on around Ashford and Margate, apparently. I think we're going to possibly hear some pretty terrifying stories that are going to come out over that, and I'm really, really worried about it. So Friday, I'm having various different meetings with various different people about the hospital, and then there's a public meeting in the evening, and I'm really um, all over that already. Hopefully you can talk a bit about actually how you think students might have made a difference oh, in this election. Huge. Well, I don't think I'd be here without you guys. <laughs> But, um, and thank you, thank you, thank you for everyone who got involved, who helped, who leafleted, even just spoke to each other about registering. That is a massive, massive thing, because even if you don't vote Labour, you know, I want you to have your voice, obviously. My son's 18, he's telling all his friends, get registered, especially as we could do this all over again. So that is a really important thing. Yeah. Do you mind me asking you a bit about your journey into politics and why oh, you yeah. why decided to stand? I got involved with the local Labour Party about five years ago. My children were old enough for me to go to the evening meetings at all meetings in the evening which I'm trying to change because of people with children and other commitments as well um, and I went along there are a few lovely people in a room I thought oh, you know this is okay and then it sort of started growing and after a few weeks I was kind of asked to chair the branch and I thought yeah, okay I can do that then there was a city council election and all sorts of things I just thought yeah yeah I can do that and it just kind of grew and grew and grew and um I thought, like everyone else, you know, we had three more years till the general election. I thought, 2020, I can get myself ready. Maybe I'll stand, depending on if anyone else throws their hat in the ring. Joined the Joe Cox um, Labour Party Women in Parliament scheme. 
And uh, just, you know, I'd only had two of the kind of sessions. <laughs> so we haven't even finished that yet. I haven't even finished my training. And I thought, OK, this is a really safe Tory seat. It's OK. You know, I won't win. I'll just, you know, go for it. Thank <laughs> you. OK, so that's kind of my journey in a, you know, but I've always been political. I remember as a pretty tiny person watching things that Thatcher did, things about the miners' strike, um, this is actually taking your milk away at school in the 80s, those kinds of things. And just becoming aware of inequality in the 80s, really, and haves and haves nots. And it's very like that now, again. You know, it really reminds me of those times. So, yeah. yeah. And two more questions, and I'll open it up for people to share their experience with us. Um, Brexit. So, Brexit is obviously a massive thing for us yeah. here at Kent. We're the European University in mm -hmm. the UK. In terms of how do you see Brexit negotiations going and making sure that the voices of students and country residents are heard in that process? It's so important. It's like, you know, I keep saying I've got so many priorities, but obviously for Canterbury District, Brexit is huge. You know, much more, I mean, I'll talk to my other colleagues from up north and things, and they, they're not quite as bothered. And, you know, there was a bit of a north-south divide with the vote, as you probably know. Um, and lots of Labour voters voted to leave up north. But here... I am really dreading the effects, the after effects of Brexit on our economy, actually. Um, so many things are dependent on you know, the university. And I just don't know, I don't think any of us know how it's going to go, but especially now, everything's up in the air and unknown. And we're, we're just there, we're kind of poised to go, right, you know, someone came up to me today and asked where I stood on human rights. <laughs> Ended up talking for quite a while because, <laughs> you know, that's one of my things. But, but those are the things that are so important, you know, safeguarding this university's staff and the courses and all of those things, our economy, and, you know, just the jobs for the EU citizens in Canterbury, you know, I'm going to be all over it. You know, we need to just be there and be at that table and just safeguard as much as we can, really. I think it's very important. Brilliant. And one of the last one for me is there are hundreds of students in the university on campus that voted for you. How mm. will you make sure you represent their voices in Parliament and hear them throughout your time? I think the most important thing, like I said in one of the debates, we, we were kind of asked, what will you do for students? And I just thought, do you know what? Instead of asking me what I'm going to do for students, you know, let's ask students what they want me to do. You know, I mean, I've got an 18-year-old summer. That does not make me an authority on what all students need or want. There's going to be as many answers as there are people in this room. So you can't just, it's, it's like saying, what will I do for old people? You can't just stereotype students only want to be, you know, like I said, only want to be interested in tuition fees and partying all night. You know, the students I know here are intelligent really interesting, engaging, thinking people. And I might be older than some of them, but there's a couple here that are really good friends that I really enjoy the company of. Leon over there, for example. And, you know, people that have got a lot to tell me about. You know, I've got to learn from you guys. So it's really a question of staying in touch. If you don't think I'm doing enough, if you don't think I've noticed something that's going on, please tell me. You know, that's, that's what I'm here for. So rather than telling you what I think you need, you know, I think it's important to, to tell me, actually. Does so anyone want to sort of share about why you voted this time? Why you might have voted differently? Hello, my name's Nadia, and I unfortunately, this is my first general election. I turned 18 a year ago. In fact, I missed the Brexit vote by a day. I was too young. <laughs> so, um, my degree is politics, and I'm very, very interested in politics. And really, at the beginning of the election, I wasn't sure who I was going to vote for, and I didn't really quite understand if any of the parties truly represented me. However, following the election, I feel that Jeremy Corbyn actually ran an amazing campaign and the way that he was in the leaders' debate in particular and also the question time, I think was really poignant to me. So that's basically my story. That's a really interesting point because people at the beginning of the campaign, we came straight out of the Kent County Council campaign, we had lunch and then started the campaign for the general election, literally. Um, and at the beginning people were going, well, you know, I've always voted Labour or I like Labour, but nah, not Jeremy, nah, you know, even Labour people. And I kind of thought, this is going to be quite tricky and I'd sort of do my thing, like, Jeremy's a really nice guy and, you know, but that, that wasn't kind of working. And then, I think, personally, my take on how it changed was, those debates, like Nadia said, you know, literally, you know, instead of the press painting him as one particular thing, there he was, warts and all, in front of the cameras, which other people didn't seem to want to do. And you can't spin that, can you? You know, that's him, face to face, being him, being real. And people are like, oh, you know, okay, he's not this ogre, he's not this kind of awful person. And even people sort of to the right of my party were, were kind of saying, Okay, you know, and I think that really did. That was another turning point. There were several, like our manifesto, and that was, yeah, definitely people have got behind Jeremy. I would say. Brilliant. Anyone else from over this side of the room? I just wanted to say thank you for um, 
being a normal person. Um, it's, this election, I feel like it's been... A, it just happened quickly. Everyone was eating lunch, Teresa was like, election, so everyone was go. And it was just a lot of sound bites, but from both you and Jeremy Corbyn, you both appear to be normal people genuinely interested in the issues of this area. And I live in North Thanet, unfortunately. Um, but now you've given me hope that maybe one day North Thanet will be released from Tory prison and I can actually make a change. So among my peers in that area, um, you've really inspired us that there is hope to swap these safe seats and that they don't always have to be safe seats. Thank you. Thank you. That's really nice, actually. Um, the thing is, I am a completely ordinary person. I'm a single mum, and I've just I've been a teaching assistant, and I've, I've led life. And I think, you know, all my life I've heard about there needs to be more women in politics, there needs to be more normal people. And then you sort of meet people who say there should be more normal people, but, you know, I've got a doctorate in so-and-so, and I've got a, you know, which is great, but I am just a normal person, so... You know, the, idea, the difference between me and, Jer me and Jeremy Corbyn's Freudian slip, me and Julian Fraser kind of voting on things, is that I doubt very much he's met many people that are affected by the bedroom tax or tax credits or any of the things that affect my daily life and the people that I know, and especially the people around here that have been at the primary schools I've taught at. And I'll be there, and I will know exactly what I'm doing. So if I get it wrong, there's no excuse, because I know and I've been there, but I'm less likely to get it wrong because I'm not... It's not an academic exercise to me, it's my real live life and, and that of my friends. So, you know, I'm proud that I'm doing that for ordinary people because it doesn't happen often. It's just something we talk about. So, yeah, thank you. That was really sweet. <laughs> Anyone else over this side of the room that wants to share their experience about why they voted? If not, we'll go over here. So, I'm a member of the Green Party and I've actually always voted Green, but this time I did vote Labour uh, just because I saw uh, some of you guys polling that suggested you might actually win here and I didn't want you to lose by one vote that would have made it my vote. So I did vote Labour and also because I mean, I've never always, I haven't never, have been a big fan of Jeremy Corbyn necessarily but I also I think he's a good person and I want to see a good person in government so I want to support you. Uh, but I feel a bit weird and conflicted now because I'm not leading the Green Party, they are closest to my views uh, but also I want to support you and I want to support this constituency in staying Labour and I don't know whether it's ever going to change um, <laughs> uh, there's ever going to be any more collaboration between Labour and Green or indeed other parties. I was quite upset about the dismissal of the progressive lines between, you know, Labour from Labour and the Lib Dems. Yeah. Yeah. That I don't want to talk necessarily too much about the progressive alliance yeah. idea locally because lots of untruths were told in the media, and I'm not going to kind of play that game. And there were a few kind of discussions back scene backstage but our parties kind of tell us what to do really in that sense I think the Greens are a bit more free in that area actually mm. I think there's not so much pressure uh, yeah, and it's a smaller party so yeah um, but locally absolutely 100% I mean Henry is such a nice guy and we were sort of staying in touch quite a bit during the campaign and we have collaborated with the Green Party locally and I keep saying this, but gr the green issues in the environment is a massive thing for me because I've got two children apart from anything, and I know that we're breathing in horrendous toxic air for a start here. That's a huge problem. There's all sorts of other things, like what we're doing to the oceans and you know, plastic beads and killing marine wildlife and stuff. I've been a member of Greenpeace for a long, long time and followed Friends of the Earth and things, so I really hope we can learn more from the Green Party because I mean, I've got a couple of friends, actually, that are lecturers here that are really well known in sort of the green issues and I've begged them to kind of help me get more green because to be honest, I'm always a bit too honest possibly, but Labour hasn't been quite as environmentally aware as I'd really like it to have been in the past with manifestos and things. So I'm going to be kind of nag, nag, nagging away. And just, you know, I really do want us to, you know, that's the future. My son was saying exactly the same as you just now on the train home actually and saying, um, you know, you're pretty lucky I didn't vote Greens, but, you know, it's our future and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I've got to listen. I've got to listen about that. And, again, if, I don't, if I'm not doing something right or if I haven't heard about a campaign that's going on that's something to do with the environment that, you know, you guys know more about, please let me know. Which really concerns me, and I think concerns a lot of people that didn't vote for Labour, is the idea of our national debt. It's something that nearly keeps me up at night when I have to think about this. I think it shouldn't be a party political issue either. What can you kind of do to reassure non-Labour voters like me that 
Labour has that at heart in its interest to reduce the damage. That's, that's a really interesting question, actually. Well, I mean, I represent everyone now in Canterbury and Straw and the villages. It's not just people that are in my party or that I know personally or that are really nice or that voted for Labour. I've got to represent the Tories as well, which is something I've never had to think about in my, <laughs> in my life. But, you know, they will be writing to me and nagging about stuff. Um, in terms of the debt, that's really interesting. Um, We've, we've had seven years of austerity, and yet under this government, under seven years of austerity, which you know probably most of you know affects women, um, BME populations, the worst, you know minorities, everyone who's kind of pretty much bottom of the ladder, you know has had to pay the price of austerity. It hasn't worked. We've tripled our national debt. Where's that money gone that you clawed back from disabled people, single parents, people on tax credits? though, don't you think it's maybe an indictment upon policies of the left that they've tried to reduce the national debt as much as they can with austerity which has been seen to be severe, yet yeah, there's been very little change that's really been able to happen. Yeah, I mean John McDonnell has this, this system, he's our shadow chancellor for those who don't know probably all of you do, he's got a system where he will consult with a whole team of economists from pretty much all around the world, I think. He's one of those, from what I gather, one of those very open-minded people who will take advice on, you know, there's, there's people on his team that are really pro-globalisation, people that aren't, you know, and I think he's one of those, I think that's really wise, to take advice from all kinds of different people with different experiences. My economic knowledge, personally, is pretty small, I'd say that's probably my, one of my weakest areas. I'll have to get lots of advice and help on that, but, um, but yeah, I'll definitely be looking, I mean, debt, you know, that's important, but also, we've got the money to spend on public services. We're not hard up, we don't need to take money from poor disabled people, we really don't, and I, I hate that, I've been angry about that for a long time. So we can do both, you know, fifth richest economy in the world, we should be able to sort it out. Um, a long term, like Labour support, I've been um, supportive of the party since before I can vote and everything. Um, one of the reasons that, one of the many reasons I voted for Labour is because um, I was very impressed with the manifesto when it came out, um, even relating to the debt question, I mean, you guys showed how everything would be paid for. Um, I heard the Conservative one as well, and they promised to um, cut corporation tax to 17%, whilst also increasing their military spending, um, I believe half a percent higher than the rate of inflation, as well as meeting uh, NATO standards of 2% of GDP, so okay. this is a party they, which... Did you read manifesto? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but principally, um, that is a manifesto which promises to increase spending in certain areas whilst cutting yeah. its income, so yeah. logically I would say that's going to increase the debt, if anything. Whereas the Labour one is fully costed, yeah. which, uh, which I'd say is another way in which the Labour Party presents sensible politics. Um, well, um, we, we said we would always fully cost it, and then, you know, the brilliant thing about the Conservatives <coughs> is that they kind of always say, where's the magic money tree, Jeremy? You're like, well, exactly what are your costings? And, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, so it's slightly hypocritical, isn't it, really? And yeah, if we can find the money for the armed services, can't we afford to get less people to food banks? You know, really. I know those things are important as well, but, you know, nurses going to food banks and Theresa May is going, there are lots of complex reasons. Actually, there's one reason. They haven't got enough money and they can't afford food. That's, you know, so that, you know, we have to change that urgently and we can afford to. We can afford to spend money on and the corporation tax thing. We've said we'll rise it, we'll raise it, but it's still going to be the smallest in Europe, you know. Another one as well, I was, I was really pleased as well that the manifesto also said there'd be a lower rate of corporation tax for small businesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's something like if you earn, I've probably got my figures wrong, don't come this. I think it's if you've got an income of over 300,000, it's a certain yeah. amount, and under, it's less, you know, that kind of, that's common sense, isn't it? You know, why charge everyone the same? You know, and again, with our tax ideas, we're only going to be charging people on the very top 5%. So it's not a lot of us, you know, 95% of people won't pay more VAT or tax. That's fair, surely. Do you have any pet issues that you might fight for? How long have we got? I've got so long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just one of those people who's watched Question Time and thrown in the socks for years. So, I mean, I suppose the natural things that I fall into are kind of women and families and children and... LGBT politics, you know, I want to be as different to Julian Brazier as possible. And the fact, I, was, I was really shocked. I got, it was very lovely, but I got so many comments about me going to Pride, and I just thought, why wouldn't I go to, you know, that's, that's like, a, it's really surprised me. Kind of, why wouldn't I be really excited about going to, you know, it's a great fun party, and I don't get that at all, but <coughs> people seem to be really pleased that I did that. And yeah, I'll, have, I'll probably have my own 
pet issues, but I think the thing is to listen to everyone else as well. You know, that's really important. There, there are people here that will have an issue that is so important to them that I may never have heard about or, you know, not know anything about at all. It might be a really niche thing, but of course I'd love to hear about it and get involved if I can. Yeah, so I'm afraid I'll probably do lots and lots and lots of that kind of thing. Hello, um, as someone who's recently joined the Labour Party and wants to be on the sort of the front line, so to say, of opposing uh, the Tories' plan for our country uh, with things like their um, union with the DUP, and yes, and uh, all the other distracting things like the privatisation of the NHS and cuts to welfare to some of the most vulnerable people. What do you think would be the best way to get involved in that way and making, sort of contributing to the opposition? That's a really good question. Um, come to local branch meetings. They're not always the most exciting thing in the world, although I chair them in Canterbury, but I'm not going to anymore. But um, come to branch meetings, um, get involved with, if you're in a union, follow what your union does. Find, I was going to say find a Labour MP, you've got me now. <laughs> Just come, kind of follow what I do in Parliament and kind of get as involved as you can and send me your ideas and, you know, again, just be in touch, just sort of follow what our plans are to oppose the Tories and spread the word. We've got um, city council elections in 2019, so we're always looking for people to oppose the Tories here. Get involved with that kind of thing, you know, find out who in the Labour Party is most aligned with what you're most interested in, write to them, come along and hear them speak, you know, that, just get as involved as you want to, we're not at all them and us, not at all, you know, so please get involved. What do you attribute your success in Canterbury to? Well, the Tories would tell you guys it's all your fault. <laughs> a massive thing you know if you hadn't I think I think what galvanized the students was watching the Brexit vote and thinking damn you know, didn't get the chance to kind of stop that or get involved as much as we wanted to and seeing the sort of inequality and seeing the way that the Tories just have this attitude that because young people don't normally vote for them they were just kind of you know just sort of thing so we need you guys to be involved that that was a massive part of our campaign but also we had people that have said they've always voted Tory all their lives and older people that are really peeved with their pension plans and social care and they're losing money. It's people that were losing money on an everyday basis, you know, struggling to make ends meet. So it wasn't just the student vote, although here, I can't tell you how grateful I am that you got out. I really, honestly, it made such a difference. It really, you know, it was wonderful. I got... We were driving around all the polling stations on election day and someone said to me, there are queues at the uni and I kind of thought, nah, you know, just a few people. We came up here and it was like, oh, you know, just queues to vote. It was, it was so exciting, you know, and I thought, yeah, we're doing something right. We must be doing something right. Now, with regards to Brexit, obviously it does hit the South East quite hard. Yeah. Um, in one area in particular is science, research and development. Yeah. Uh, now, for every one pound we invest in science research and development, 20 pence comes back to the economy that same year, and then every year, each year afterwards. Okay. Um, the only manifesto I saw that had anything really protecting that level of funding was the Liberal Democrats. Now, I did vote Labour this time. I thought it was a good idea, but I was wondering what you would do personally and what your party's plan is with regards to that funding. Okay, well we obviously need to look at that and do something about it. Again, I didn't know about that, I'm sorry, but um, I'm quite friendly now with Mike Goldsworthy, who is the Scientist for EU yeah. Chair, um, and I've said to him, please can I rack your brains about absolutely everything to do with science funding? I've already sort of said it's something I don't know enough about. I know friends of his who are also scientists at various different universities, including Cambridge, who have said that they're on the case, they're going to advise Labour on all of that, so I know we've got some really good people that are looking into it, so if I'm not doing enough, if you think I need to know something, please send me the details. I did correspond with your predecessor. Have you done that? Oh, uh, God, sorry. I, I have really... got hundreds of Oh, no, you're uh, Julius Brazer. I, he didn't ever reply, so okay. hopefully okay. you will. Just, just <laughs> me. At the moment, I've literally, I haven't got my office set up, and I've got kind of, you know, emails just kind of coming in, but, you know, I will absolutely look at that. And I was curious as to your personal views on uh, sorting children like Cattle at 11 and sending some to good schools and some to bad schools and how the Labour Party is going to move forward on eradicating grammar schools. In Kent, we've occasionally had these kind of parent referendums where parents are asked, and if you're in a coffee shop with loads of parents and it comes up to your child being 11, they all go, isn't it terrible, isn't it awful, just dialing my coach, you know, and you kind of think, 
bit hypocritical. I don't want to be a hypocrite. My both my sons got into the grammar. I was really I couldn't afford loads of coaching. I didn't do that whole kind of thing. I am not academic in any way. I didn't understand the papers or anything. So um, they were. I was just you know like God. That, that's a relief in a way because of the system. I was really relieved that they had that choice. The oldest one is about to finish his A-levels and he's done really well under that system. The youngest one didn't get on. It was too much pressure. He's now gone to a completely different school system and he hated the grammar system. Um, so that was a learning curve for me because coming from London, I wasn't really aware of how it worked either. Um, the Labour Party have said, we're not going to destroy existing grammars. You know, they work for some people. It's nice that parents have a choice. We're also not going to fund great big lovely new kind of grammar palaces, which is what the Tories have sort of said they'll do. We really want a fair education system for all, and I don't know why that's so difficult to achieve, but it's kind of basic, you know, we want everyone to have the same level playing field. We're working on that all the time. I was really proud of Angela Rayner during our, um, she's on the ball, she's like me, she left school at 16, she's completely kind of normal, and um, she's again been appointed Shadow Secretary for Education, thank goodness, and uh, she's on that all the time, so we are, that is one of our, we've got this campaign called Education Not Segregation, which is about that, so we're working on it constantly. What exactly are your sort of stances on, um, I guess, defence and, you know, uh, budgets to the armed forces and whatnot? Okay, slightly different angle from my point of view because I don't hold myself up as an expert on that in any way. But um, when I worked at a local primary school quite a few years ago, a lot of our children had parents on the army base and they would come back from their tour of duty in Afghanistan and they would be made redundant. Those, those guys that had been, and women, that had been on the front line physically, you know, hurt, often pretty badly, they were coming home, they were being sent somewhere else their barracks was shut down, they didn't know what their future was going to be, they weren't political, but they came back here, they had tiny children in my class, they didn't know where they were going to go, they reported back about lack of equipment, even the fact that they were having to buy their own backpack, I mean that's, that's honestly happening apparently, um, so we really need to, to do something to defend our armed forces, you know, they're not choosing their battles, they've got to be any political, we're sending them, you know, I've been asked about how we would vote in conflicts and I think as politicians, we have to be aware that we're basically sending our friends, family, brothers, sisters to that incredibly awful, difficult, horrible situation, potentially. You know, we've got to look their mums and dads in the eye. We've got to know that we've equipped them for this horrific situation. That's our job. You know, it's not good enough to say we can't afford to, is it really? Do you say the approach is to kind of have a more inclusive and uh, like working together across the sort of aisle um, politics? Okay, I think... I've been talking about this with, with Labour colleagues for so long and I think the only possible way to do that is to make Parliament more diverse. You know, if, we, if we're looking around and there's only white middle class or quite posh men, we're not going to get it right, are we? We're not going to reach across to everybody and find out what everybody's concerns or issues are. And thankfully in Parliament the other day I thought, oh, this is a little bit more, you know, and we have got more and more diversity coming in and, you know, two of my friends are the first Sikh MPs in Parliament. I'm really proud of them. That's really fantastic. But yeah, I think it is about representing everyone, listening to everyone, because otherwise people are going to feel polarised, aren't they? They're going to feel left out, that their communities aren't represented, um, that they're not being listened to, that there's just one way, there's just one community <coughs> being represented, one religion, one sex. You know, it's... It's got to be, everybody, that's the only way. We've got to all be around the table. And I think on the Joe Cox scheme, we talk about this all the time, obviously, because we're all women. And it's all about, you know, there's a big assumption in things like feminism that, you know, I'm okay, I've made it, I'm a politician, but I'm white and I'm, you know, from a fairly okay background. And feminism even has to be inclusive of everyone. And, you know, it, it's, a, it's our responsibility to look around us and see that, Everyone's brought up the ladder with us. We're not going there and then pulling it up. That that goes across, you know, communities. You know, people from council estates should be there. People of all different colours and faiths and everything should be there. That that's the only way, I think, the only answer for us all to talk together and cooperate. Do about the situation of the rubbish, which is all over in Hale's place in some parts of the city. It's quite disgusting in parts, really. Parts, really. I know. Um, on the city council, who are responsible for your rubbish, we've now got four councillors, we had three before last week, and we're the official opposition, so as much as possible we need to go, come on, come on, come on, and I think when Alan Baldock, the leader of our group, 
goes to the, the big council meetings, he mentions it pretty much all the time. He's got a reputation as the rubbish council, which is a bit unfortunate. <laughs> but, he, but he goes around taking photos of all of this because that's, see, that's another assumption in Canterbury, that older people are always lovely and tidy with their rubbish, and students chuck their stuff around. It's rubbish. Absolute sorry. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute BS, because, you know, you don't. And you have every right to live in a lovely neighbourhood as well. And I'll tell you one thing that does happen in Canterbury. Seagulls are responsible for a lot of the rubbish thing, I don't think you realise. They literally kind of hover over the bins and chuck stuff over. They're really bad, you know. But, um, but yeah, you need to harass us as much as possible. I will be in touch with our council team and just say, you know, students would quite like it to be tidy as well. I think they know that. We've just got to do our job. You know, yeah, Circa needs to do their job. Um, so, yeah, that is an issue in Canterbury. Thank you for raising it. Just keep raising it as much as you can. This could say the gentleman over there asked about science funding. Yes. Um, we currently spend 1.7% of GDP on science. Your policy is actually to increase it to 3%. Is it, is so, it, you're, you're, doing, you're, doing, you're going the right way. Well, I, no, I know the people that are working to do that, and I don't pretend to about it at all, but I do know people that do, so yeah, I'll make sure that we I do think the other side that's really important here is um, what we're doing for people from the European Union who are working in this country uh, and uh, making yeah. them feel secure. Uh, it's already affecting this university. People have left because they feel unwanted. I'd say probably most of my friends work for the university that are in Canterbury and uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting messages all the time going, oh, so and so's left or they're, they're worried about. And what, I, what I hate most about the left thing is they're going to countries they may never have actually grown up in or know. They certainly don't call them home. This is their home. And that is pretty shameful, isn't it, that we're sending people back somewhere. I mean, that, that whole thing makes me really, really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And also we need these, you know, we need everybody. We need them here. We need scientists. You know, it's just completely mad, isn't it? It, it doesn't make any sense at all. So, you know, the Labour Party have said we have to safeguard those working rights and keep people here if we possibly can. But, you know, at the moment we have got a chance to really hold this government to account. And then can I ask one final question as about education? So, obviously lots of people sat in this room, their livelihoods and student being a student depends on education. So can you talk a bit about how you're going to approach things like student funding, making sure students can afford to be at university? Because one of the things that we hear constantly is that so many students are feeling a squeeze and might have to drop out because of money. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's kind of normal now for students to have to have a job that's almost as many hours as they're studying, which just seems like, you know, and at people my age that, that tried to do that dropped out because they just couldn't manage the workload and things. But students are expected to do it now. It's kind of a normal thing. And I'm not sure, I'm not comfortable with that. I just, that, you know, I mean, my son going up to uni next year without the maintenance agreement, I could never, have, you know, the maintenance allowance, I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have afforded to pay his rent even as a single mum. You know, students have got horrible expenses, rent, you know, just even going out occasionally would be quite nice, buying food, you know, not having to just eat plain rice at the end of the week. You know, those are, those are really important things. I think we recognise, I hope, as a party, that not only do we have to help with fees, but there's, it's, it's your life, it's rents, it's, you know, especially in London. How on earth does anyone, you know, there are, there are horrible stories of young women having to fund their way through education in a pretty horrific way. You know, lots of Labour MPs are really over that. They've tabled motions about making sure that that kind of thing is outlawed. You know, that, that men that kind of exploit young women, that, that's a massive issue. I'm all over that one. Um, so, yeah, we need to just support students because they're people and they're contributing. You know, students coming to university, they're not getting a free ride and then, you know, sailing off. They're contributing to our future and our lives and our governments and, you know, science and absolutely everything, you know, medicine. So it's our job, isn't it, to support you? <laughs> so, yeah, Brilliant. We have to look at that a lot. So thank you very much for making time to talk to us tonight and hopefully we can make tonight a regular feature as well. I love it. I'd absolutely love it. You're really nice. So thank you very much. <laughs> so thank you. And thank you.